Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good morning. I'm so pleased to be here. And big thank you to Jane for inviting me today. Um, I am going to start off just by telling you a little bit about me and, and how I got here. Uh, I grew up in a family of technologists. Uh, my sister and I were always encouraged to play with computers, take them apart, put them back together. And she and I naturally gravitated towards designing our own games. So we did this for, for some time. And when we were ready to go to school, uh, there were no such things as game design and development degree programs as there are now. So I ended up getting a degree in math and comp sci, worked for corporate America for a while, and then decided to start a company called WomenGamers.com with my sister. And the reason was because we played games, our friends played, our cousins played, but we'd open up most gaming magazines and look at most gaming websites, and they weren't targeting us. So um, we decided to start this company. And we did a lot of consulting to game studios and publishers who wanted to target women. And we started the first uh, scholarship program for women to pursue degrees in game design and development here within the US. So did this for quite some time, in fact, for about uh, 10 years or so. Then um, there was this big shift in the games industry. Suddenly, everybody was talking about the casual gamer and the mass market. So I decided I wanted to go back to business school to learn more about what it was like to go after VC funding and start a studio. I wanted to learn more about accounting and finance. So decided to go back to my alma mater and threw myself into these things called case competitions. I don't know if you're familiar with what these are, but this is when a company will go to a business school with a real life challenge. And so I love these. These were super fun. Uh, there was a contest between UNC and Duke, big basketball rivals, right? And I was on my sixth one, and IBM came, and they were sponsoring this competition. And they said, we've got business process management software, and we're looking for innovative ways of explaining it to non-techies. I had no clue what the heck business process management software was, right? They handed us each, each team a stack of papers this thick, and they said, go read these case studies. So I'm like, all right, I'm reading, I'm reading. And maybe it was because I was playing a lot of strategy games at the time, but I was thinking, OK, this is a strategy game. You tweak different business rules. You're seeing how it affects your broader ecosystem. You could have competing models. You could collaborate around a model. So I tell my teammates, hey, we need to pitch a strategy game. And I ended up arguing with one of my teammates till about 2 in the morning. And we have to pitch at 8, right? So he's saying, uh, games are for kids. IBM is too conservative of a company. They're never going to buy off on this idea. And I say, you know, the average age of the gamer today is 35 years old. 43% of PC gamers, 38% of console gamers are women. And in fact, if you think about it, games can be incredibly adept at explaining complex systems. All right, so uh, he ends up picking up his backpack and leaving the team, right? So he abandons us. And we go and we pitch this idea for the strategy game the next day. And unbeknownst to me, one of the VPs for strategy was a judge. And she pulled me aside right after the pitch. And she said, I'm funding this game right now. Can you make it for me in three months? I'm like, well, OK. You know, it can take years to make a really good video game. Uh, how am I going to pull this off? And, and she says, ah, I'm just looking for proof of concept to see if you can even use a video game to help explain something as complex as business process management to people. So she gave me funding, and I started interning while I was getting my MBA full time and going to class. With, I started working with a local game studio, and together we made a game called Innovate with the number eight. And uh, in essence, we released it for free via IBM's academic initiative. And within six months, we had over 1,000 universities worldwide downloading and using that game, many of which started to use it as part of their core curriculum. So this VP turns to me and she says, well, let's do another test. I'm curious, is it just students and teachers who'd be interested in this? Or would clients and business partners also be interested? So, 
Uh, she gave me more funding to do a supply chain version of the game and then a smarter cities version of the game. And they became our number one lead generating assets for our brand at the time. So she says, okay, you're my new head of games for marketing. I want to, you to incubate this program here. And so I, I started working at IBM. And um, what was interesting to me as an entrepreneur was, again, seeing all of these customers coming to our booths when we would show this off, uh, saying things like, I can imagine using a game like this to train my own people, or in effect, to optimize our own process models in a strategy game in real time. So, interesting thing that happened was that the process change games in particular started to get the attention of the Department of Defense. And I was invited to an enterprise architecture summit that was sponsored by United States Transportation Command. And for those who don't know what US Transcom is, they manage the logistics across all the branches of the military so that when there's an earthquake in Haiti, for example, they got to figure out how to get the right stuff to the right place at the right time, at the right cost, working with all of these different entities, including local governments. So right before I go to give my pitch about process change games, the four-star general who's responsible for US Transcom gets up and he gives a talk and he shows a timeline and he says, look at what has happened around the world in the last nine months that we've had to respond to. And he starts ticking off like 20 different things. We've got volcanoes in Iceland, earthquakes in Haiti, tsunamis in Japan. We've got these trade routes being compromised. He lists them off. He says, how can we as an organization have ever been able to be prepared for even a subset of things on this list, much less all of them? And he says, but even more importantly, how are we supposed to have been able to vet and get mind share of people well before boots are on the ground? How is it that we do that? Can we use advanced serious games as a mechanism to do this? And then he sort of turns over the podium to me. And so I get up and I talk about process change games, et cetera, and I said, you know, we're at this in interesting um, confluence in time where we've got the ability to integrate real data and real processes within very sophisticated gaming engines, such that you can start to use these kinds of games for things like strategic execution and tactical operations, okay? And so this four-star pulls me aside and says, okay, what are you doing a month from now? Can you come back and present at the DARPA Innovation Summit, okay? And as an aside, I was telling the folks, Jane and her friends last night, that at this time I was like seven months pregnant, right? So I'm like, sure, I'll be there in a month. Uh, <laughs> so a week before the summit, I get a call from his assistant who says, the general wants you to invite whomever you want from the games industry to make this vision a reality. If you want to invite the president of Nintendo, invite the president of Nintendo. And I said, sir, how am I going to get the president of Nintendo to your conference in a week? And he says, don't worry, the invitation will come from the Secretary of Defense. <laughs> <laughs> Sweat. Like, what? Uh, so I ended up inviting someone I had met at a conference called GDC, the Game Developers Conference. This is sort of the end all be all for those in the games industry to kind of see what the next generation engines are, right? The engines and tools and games. So this, uh, the person I invited was, uh, had finished his PhD at NC State. And he had done, he had created this incredible multiplayer real-time strategy game to help teach, or rather, um, multiplayer real-time strategy game that had a very interesting engine where, in essence, you can jump around time and change your decisions. So do you guys remember the movie Back to the Future? Right, remember the scene where McFly is holding up a Polaroid picture, and because of something he did in the past, he's slowly fading? Remember? So this guy's game engine worked in the same way. I could move backwards in time change a decision, and that timeline would propagate to all of the other players present, okay? The reason I invited him was I couldn't think of a better way to optimize a process on the fly than being able to change my decisions over time in a multiplayer safe environment, right? So he and I go, and we go and co-pitch co to DARPA, and the general pulls me aside and said, what are you doing two weeks from now? Remember how pregnant I am? Right? 
I'm hearing two weeks from now. I'd like you to come and, and have a meeting with me at the Pentagon. And uh, so we went and we presented this idea to the Secretary of Defense. And again, it was this, this concept of how can you use games that are in, can be incredibly adept at explaining complex systems as a mechanism to vet ideas, vet processes, and get buy-in. Um, so because of this interest, I was then asked to incubate a serious games program within IBM's consulting division. So advanced serious games that integrated real data, real processes, initially for defense, in particular for disaster preparedness, disaster response, but then quickly across industry. And this is when AI uh, and investments in AI at IBM really started to come to the forefront. So I got extremely interested in the use of artificial intelligence, in particular with regards to gathering information about people and about situations and then curating experiences specifically for them. And of course, this also got me very interested in ethics, like because there's a lot of power in that. Right? I can actually be able to start influencing people's mindsets, people's behaviors. So extreme interest in, in artificial intelligence and ethics. And um, that led me to my next role, uh, which is I had this epiphany, this incredible experience. And I'm, I'm going to tell you what this is. It's, it's called medical Minecraft. So here's the story. The story is that you know I'm in the midst of, you know, talking about AI and working with different clients for diff different kinds of advanced games. And I get this phone call from this teacher out in Texas. He's a high school teacher. His name is David Conover. And he reaches out to me and he says, hey, I'm teaching computer science, but the way that I'm teaching it is through game design. But not just any game design, serious game design. And he said, uh, this year, the Center for Disease Control is sponsoring a theme for my class. Okay? And he says, the theme is that um, they want my students to design a video game that will train other kids about pathogens and pandemics. Okay? So um, I said, oh, that's very interesting. And he says, well, my kids have reskinned Minecraft such that you can fly a nanobot through a human body. And when the nanobot, oh, let me mute this. When the nanobot meets with a pathogen within the body, uh, we want to be able to communicate with IBM's Watson, which has been trained in pathogens. So from within the video game, we want to directly interface and ask questions about how would I recognize signs of Ebola, right? Or what are the symptoms of tuberculosis? So I, st I was intrigued, immediately intrigued, and I'm like, okay, which high school is this? I find out this is actually a disadvantaged, it's okay, it's okay, it, this is a disadvantaged school out in Texas. This is not a fancy schmancy Princeton prep school, right? So I start to talk to these kids, these students within the classroom and learning about their projects. And I was so completely overwhelmed by the level of enthusiasm of these kids that I convinced our PR and comms department to fly a TV crew out with me and film this documentary, okay? So we go, we show up in the class, and I notice we, you know, we've got all of our, our camera equipment. The principal never came out to greet us. So I thought that was kind of strange, right? So we go to his classroom, and we're interviewing the different kids. There's this one girl who uh, uh, I was asking her, tell me why you love this class so much, because you could tell. I mean, she was so ebullient, right? And she says, you know, my dad has been deployed on multiple tours of duty to Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, he really suffers from depression and the uh, PTSD in particular. And the only thing that really helps him manage his stress is playing video games. So she said, I am devoting my career towards understanding games for health. So I started asking her questions about, oh, have you heard of this research and that research? And she knew it all, right? Again, so again, this really inspiring. So. We filmed this documentary, this video goes viral. Next thing I know, the teacher and I are sort of flowing around the world to talk about education. He gets recognized by Obama's White House as being this champion for change, right? And then within two weeks of this, I get a phone call from him and he says, Phaedra, I think I'm gonna lose my job. I said, what are you talking about? And he says, well, the principal doesn't understand what I'm trying to do. 
or how to measure success in a classroom like mine. He goes on to say, I have built the culture of my classroom to really be entrepreneurial in style, very entrepreneurial in style, around social impact so that kids are able to recognize and connect technology to things that they care about. They come up with the business plans. They have a rotating leadership model. He wasn't just working with IBM. He had NASA in there. He had Google in there, right? He had multiple different institutions coming in and Skyping with their, team, uh, their teams regularly. So I said, OK, David, here's what you've got to do. Call up your superintendent and go have breakfast with him and tell him what you're trying to do, explain it. So um, he goes and he has breakfast with the superintendent and uh, the next thing I know, this entire army from Texas flies out to North Carolina where I'm based and we do a design thinking session about culture change within the classroom. I don't know how many of you are familiar with de design thinking, but it is a, a framework that has been deeply impactful into my life. So we do a design thinking session. I'm dragging him around to Hunt Library, and I drag him around to maker spaces, and I'm saying, you know, we're on the verge of this technology tsunami. We not only have to think about what is it we're teaching this next generation of kids, but also how we're teaching it. So because of that, they now have um, incorporated a, an academy at this disadvantaged school. So high school kids graduating from his class get to intern at the Watson Lab out in Texas. And what I love about this story is that it's not a story about technology as much as it, it's a story of culture change, right? So here's what these kids are doing next, right? Do you guys recognize this toy? Okay, hungry, hungry hippos. So you press the lever and your hippo eats the marbles, and that's in essence the game. The more marbles you eat, you win. So these kids, right, they were tasked, come up with a new smart toy that actually uses an old toy that does something socially impactful. Okay, that, that, was, that was the lesson. So they take this and they buy a used brainwave monitoring device off of eBay, and they hook up Arduinos to the hippos, such that without your hands, the only way you can get your hippo to eat the marbles is by going into a semi-meditative state. So you actually have to lower your heart rate, completely relax, and so, I'm asking these kids, I'm like, tell me about your business model. Like, where are you playtesting this? They're playtesting this toy to kids going through chemotherapy at the Dell Children's Hospital. And they were telling me, we're, we're building Jedi. We're building Jedi. And I was thinking, oh my god, I have goosebumps just talking about it. It's so cool. Like, you know, there was no curriculum. There was no curriculum for this. This is what the kids came up with. Again, a highly entrepreneurial, uh, dedicated to social impact. So I see an incredible advantage in using things like the intersection of, of artificial intelligence and play. And th this is a poll that I frequently uh, reference when thinking about, again, this technology tsunami that is upon us, right? This idea of robotics and artificial intelligence and automation and how incredibly impactful this will be to the jobscape and what kinds of things we need to do in order to be able to prepare, right? What does this mean to the US job market in comparison to other markets? And what are the kinds of things, again, what should we be teaching our next generation? So this medical Minecraft epiphany happened, right? And I learned all of these things and I, I was really starting to be um, just kind of possessed about what does this mean? How, how do we address this within education? So uh, I ended up running for a local, open local school board seat in my county, which is Wake County. And I sort of ran on, ran on this platform. I didn't get it, but my, uh, my VP found out that I had run, and she said, well, you know, we're thinking about opening our very first K through 12 program here at IBM, and so we can, in essence, influence the curriculum. Is this something you'd be interested in? And I'm like, yes, absolutely. I want to run with social impact and entrepreneurship. And you know, we're going to do this in collaboration with the United Nations. So this is uh, something you can Google also online. This is a research study that was created by an organization called the Future of Work, or rather, Institute for the Future. And if you look at this, these sort of spiky areas are the big macro trends. Oops, look at this one. <laughs> 
the big macro trends that are happening around the world. And the other circles are, in essence, what are the skills and competencies? This is one of many different organizations that have really been thoughtful about given what's coming, what are the kinds of skills and competencies we're looking for in our next generation? So I started to think about, all right, what is the three-step approach if we were going to tackle something like this? And the very first, per my lesson of what I learned from the medical Minecraft story, is the desperate need for a mindset shift. And this isn't just for K through 12 that I'm talking about, right? This is an idea um, that is, uh, has aggregated the work of a lot of behavioral psychologists and organizational psychologists, right? Dan Pink. Have any of you read his book, Drive? Yep, so he basically says, if you look at all the different eras of humanity, whether it's the agricultural era, the industrial era, what had motivated knowledge workers back then was really the carrot and the stick. Whereas today, what we're motivated by more than anything else is the sense of self-direction. And he goes on further to talk about three tenets of self-direction being autonomy, mastery, and purpose. But in essence, this mindset shift within the school system at least, moves from a school-centered education to a learner-centered education. And this is, in fact, something we are also adopting within IBM when thinking about our own professional development for our own sales force, right? It's how is it that we can make this personalized and curated and um, such that people feel directly impacted? So. These are the five tenets with regards to what that means, this learner-centered education, giving people a sense of agency, right? That it is something that you don't do in a broom closet. This is something that you do with others, that it is contextualized and relevant. I think about that high school girl who said, uh, you know, that she was doing this because her dad suffers from PTSD and it was a direct impact in her family, open-walled and competency-based. And Finland does such a fantastic job with this, right? No standardized courses in Finland, very little homework, right? The school boards are run by educators. It, it certainly is a, a program to look at. Year after year after year, they outpace the rest of the world in terms of their PISA scores. Adopting an entrepreneurial culture. I love this picture. <laughs> so cute. He's so cute, right? But again, this idea that entrepreneurs fail all the time, and that's OK, right? This idea of let me test, right? Here's this toy. Figure out how to make it smart. Let's try out different ideas, right? Open walls. You know, it's Skype in the classroom. Here's this class, and they're Skyping not just with us, but with NASA and with Google and with other classrooms around the world. Personalized, relevant, and contextualized, we started to directly associate and align our curriculum to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Right? And if you want to, you're curious about um, curriculum associated with the SDGs, do mind the hashtag, te hashtag teach SDGs if you're, you're curious about content. There's a, a tremendous movement in classrooms to really embrace social impact. And again, there is a tremendous amount of evidence that this works. Um, this group has been mining information and really measuring the impact of this since the, the 80s. Uh, step two is, again, now that you've thought about this cultural transformation, which, by the way, is the hard part, and I cannot underscore that enough, the culture change is the hard part, then you can start to bring in digital engagement and enablement, right? So, you know, starting with something like artificial intelligence. So this is an example of a project that we did with our corporate citizenship group where we created an AI app that helps to support teachers when they're uh, teaching math curriculum, right? So based on what kind of student is in front of that particular teacher and their competencies, it goes and it will recommend different assets for them. Watson Tutor is another one, right? We're being able to see how AI is being used to curate content based on what people's interests are. This is an example of, uh, this was actually the first course which we created for our K through 12 program, where we wanted to teach kids about uh, how to create uh, not just chatbots, but empathetic chatbots, right? And what this looked like was basically that you're, you're not only training about how to have a conversation with someone, but it can also mine sentiment 
Is this person angry? Is this person sad? Right? And personality. Based on what I'm sensing from this person in this conversation so far, I'm gauging their personality, I'm gauging their sentiment, and now I'm actually curating a highly customized conversation just for them. So we did this with kids, okay? And uh, the, what was really important when working on the Empathetic Conversation Bot project was that this is most definitely a STEAM and not a STEM endeavor. Because it is in fact knowledge of people, psychology, history, music, et cetera, that helps make that chatbot uh, nurturing, empathetic, right? In, in fact, what we did was we trained these kids on design thinking prior to doing any level of development. So uh, I'll give you an example. The, one of the first classes we worked with wanted to create an empathetic chatbot that was able to work with other kids who were experiencing bullying or who were under, were under a tremendous amount of stress, right? So they were trying to figure out, okay, if their stress is like on a level from seven, from one to 10, they're at a level seven, let's brainstorm about what kind of music we should play. Like that was the, one of the first things they were thinking about or what are the ways in which this bot could say something to someone who was under that amount of stress in order to get them to actually calm down. Which, again, really made a tremendous impression on me, this idea that indeed an understanding about people's behavior and the arts and history and strategy and et cetera was, is vitally important to a project like this. Another example of uh, the kinds of things we did, this was a, a project we did out of research with um, the Met Gala where we partnered with uh, a, uh, a brand that makes these beautiful ball gowns. And we sewed in little LED lights into the gown. And the LED lights change color based on how people, how people tweeted about the Met Gala, right? So if you tweet and you say, oh my god, I'm going to be late, I'm stuck in traffic, what do I do, uh, then the the gown would glow red, for example. So it would change color. And this is another example of ways in which you can characterize technology as being STEAM and not STEM, right? If you find people who are really interested in, in design or fashion, self-expression, here's a great way, a really great way to, to introduce internet of things to them as an example. This is a project we did called um, DJ Battle, right? Where up on a stage like this, half the stage would have a DJ and the other half would be a person with Watson on the laptop. And I would go and um, ask people from the crowd, okay, give me your Twitter handle. I enter it into Watson, it mines for that person's personality and then Watson will auto-compose music based on that person's personality. Whereas the DJ on the other half of the stage has three questions to ask that same person. What's your favorite color? What's your zodiac sign? Whatever they want, right? And then they got to look in their Rolodex and play a song. And what's interesting, again, about this is not as much, you know, which one was more effective at gauging the person's personality, but what it does do is it unlocks a great conversation about the future of AI and creativity. So again, these are the kinds of things that I think can really inspire people to think about what's coming. Uh, this is something we actually did last week. We created a Watson-powered Harry Potter sorting hat, <laughs> right? So a kid can go up to a laptop and say, okay, here's what my personality is, and then the, the hat will sort, and it will bellow out what house they're in based on their personality. So of course, one of the first things I did was rig it, right? So I wanted to rig it because I wanted my kids to, I have four, four kids, I wanted my kids to go up and put their names in, and it would belt out Slytherin. <laughs> so they do this just as I knew they would, and then they look at me, and they're like, Mom, did you do that? And I said, this is a lesson in artificial intelligence bias. <laughs> Which is so true, it's so true. Like, don't you dare think that just because it's AI, it's squeaky clean. This is your lesson, don't forget it. So again, inspiring with pop culture. What a great way to teach, right? 
This last piece, and I'll go through this quickly because I, I, I don't want to take up too much time. This last piece, uh, again, yesterday I was keynoting at the Blockchain in Government conference, which is right upstairs. This piece is quintessentially important, this last step. So when thinking about um, this idea of cultural transformation desperately needed within school systems, right? If you buy into the fact that you're not sure that the public school system is, can possibly do this kind of culture change this quickly, right, to get in front of this tech tsunami, then we have to look at new models. And this one around blockchain is something that, that inspired me, because again, I, I saw this culture change and I started to think about how do I get kids credit for things they learn in both formal as well as informal learning settings. I want to get them credit. And this isn't just for kids, this is for all of you. This is for professional development. So for those who are unfamiliar with what blockchain is, basically what it is is let's say I'm trading with you. I have my own ledger, you have your own ledger, and I have to mark on my ledger that I traded X number of widgets with you and you're marking the same thing on your ledger. If we all did this and we all traded data in this way, guaranteed there's going to be mistakes or there's gonna be fraud, right? Basically what blockchain, permissioned blockchain allows you to do is be able to have one single decentralized ledger where we're all sharing this kind of data transparently. And the big idea was, okay, can we do this with something like keeping track of credentials? So I know you're all familiar with LinkedIn, or you should be, or likely. Uh, but I could go on to LinkedIn right now and say, you know what, I'm the president of the United States and nobody would stop me, right? But the idea is with something like a, a blockchain micro-credentialing system, every time I learn anything, whether it's a formal or informal learning setting, right, that credential goes on my blockchain. This is on a decentralized ledger. So as I learn things, I don't have to go back to any single institution to get my transcript. And what is, I think, especially exciting about this is that even if I'm in a rural setting and I don't have access, I don't have a robotics teacher or a drone maintenance teacher or a comp sci teacher in my school, you know, can I learn this in Boy Scouts? Can I learn this in Girl Scouts? Can I learn this online and get credit for it and then have that credit be able to be mined by potential recruiters? So this concept of micro-credentialing is a really big deal. And in fact, pair micro-credentialing and blockchain with artificial intelligence, right? So as I'm using AI to learn about people, to learn about students, what are they good at? What do they want to be when they grow up, right? All of this information, their competencies, their skills, it can start to recommend and curate content for that learner, right, on that blockchain. So hey, I notice you're really interested in uh, cybersecurity. You may want to check out this position that just opened or look at these courses that are available online, right? And be able to track, again, on the blockchain so that as they're getting these uh, competencies, these credits follow them throughout their entire lives. That's the promise. So, Speaking of promise, so at a great example of this, that um, of the city that has done this within the U.S., is Dallas. The first, not just K through 12, but K through higher ed um, blockchain micro-credentialing project that I've seen. And it, again, started off with um, not just the K through 12, but community colleges, corporate sponsors, and higher ed all working together uh, to pull this off. So it will be interesting to see how this, how this plays out, uh, but it's something I'm truly excited about. So where would you start with something like this? Join forces. Uh, design thinking, I think, is a, a fantastic mechanism. Uh, by the way, I also I do a regular blog called gamesatwork.biz. I've got a book called Serious Games for Business. Uh, please, if there's anything I can do to help any of you, please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if there's any way I can connect you to anybody within my network. And again, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Don't go yet. Don't go oh, yet. don't go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, I was just going to say, 
If you were uh, this group and you were very enthused at the kinds of things that you're talking about and you wanted to convince your organizations to try and do more of this, what would you suggest? What, what, what would be the tips that you would use to uh, get their organizations doing this more? Right, let me put this back on. I thought I was going. No, no. I'm not <laughs> okay. you. We got to mine your brain. Okay, okay. So um, the first thing I would do, if if you're interested in any of this, sort of uh, the intersection of, of, or rather, bringing play or games or gamification into your organization, the first thing you need to understand is the taxonomy of this space. What's a game, what's a serious game, and what's gamification? And it's, it's been so interesting because when I first started at IBM doing this, it felt like I had landed a spaceship in someone's backyard. That's how it felt. And it was this constant battle. I was constantly fighting, like, no, no, this is a way to optimize engagement, and this really works, blah, blah, blah. So I, I started, and that was, you know, 10 years ago. Now, I'm at the other end of the pendulum where people are like, oh, we can do a game for this, and we can do a game for that, and we're going to do points, badges, and leaderboards, and that's what's going to, like, make everything great again. And I, I'm the one who has to, like, reel everybody back in, saying, okay, wait a minute. Let's start with design thinking. So it's, it's been really intriguing to see this, this shift. But I would say, with regards to the taxonomy, uh, so games are obviously for fun and play, right? Serious games are when you use games to do something than just entertainment. And that could be anything from marketing to training to business process optimization or let's figure out what our disaster preparedness plan is, et cetera. <clears throat> but it is a game. Gamification is when you use techniques from games as a mechanism to drive certain behaviors in something that is otherwise not a game. Okay, so this is an extremely important distinction. And there's also dangers. There's dangers with serious games and gamification. I have seen so many examples of what I call chocolate covered broccoli. <laughs> I cannot, like, beware, and you know what it tastes like when you bite into it, right? <laughs> Like, you don't want to slap a point system on something that is otherwise really onerous and call it a game. Like, no, ixnay on the gamification. Like, don't do that. I will hunt you down. Don't do that. <laughs> so a taxonomy is key. And then um, come up with, you know, the, your the folks around you who have a Rolodex of uh, puzzles in their mind or, you know, uh, ideas of ways in which to uh, incorporate play, but make sure that you're always measuring. And this is really key. Like, what is your return on investment going to look like? Are you hitting these key performance indicators that show that indeed these behaviors are changing over time? Uh, uh, that is incredibly important. Alrighty. <laughs> Sorry, long rant. No, no. <laughs> Excellent. We wanted more, more, more ideas. <laughs> That's great, Pedro. Please thank her for all her thoughts, suggestions, enthusiasm. <laughs>